Hey there, Blockhead Traders. Here at Blockhead Traders, I must inform you that we are not financial professionals. Nothing we say should be considered financial advice. We offer our own thoughts and opinions to you, the viewer. We expect you to take these opinions, form your own financial conclusions, and make your own financial decisions. Today is Wednesday, November 15th, 2023, and this is Blockhead Traders Weekly. In this week's episode, ViperXL007 is back with us. And what does Viper always bring with him? Tales from the crypto land. And in this week's episode, we are going to touch on there is no such thing as an unloaded gun. And the worst case is always possible. But before we hop to that, I want to give a shout out to our Discord, a link in the description below. Hop in there and tell us what you're trading. Tell us what type of content you're interested in. You can also find a link to thetagang.com forward slash sprocket888 where I post each and every one of my trades, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Last, you can pick this up in an audio-only format wherever you get your podcasts. And if you can't find it there, let us know and we will get it there. But let's hop to this week's content. Viper, I've been holding down the fort here, uh, doing a couple, you know, boring earnings episodes. Uh, I might add, uh, ironically, in the earnings episode that I did, I did a, then a follow-up to it. Um, and I, you know, I honestly, I didn't plan to only do the follow-up because they happened to be uh, all three for three winner, winner, chicken dinners. Um, so I'm sure it looked like I planted that stuff, but uh, I was I was very happy uh, that they panned out that way. Sad I didn't actually take any one of those trades because my capital was tied up. Um, you know, we covered some interesting things as well when you were out as far as treasuries go and uh, money supply. But, uh, you know, in, in, in fitting fashion, I think we, we need to pay a visit to the crypto land. I don't think we've been there lately. And I know over the past month or so, uh, you, you and I have been involved in an interesting crypto project, I'll say. And it, it's one that we've kind of talked about. Not I don't remember if we specifically called out many of the names of it because we we wanted to talk about the concept of it, but um, went through a little bit of a scare there, Viper. What, what do you want to talk, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so like you said at the top of the show, uh, always bringing tales of the crypto world, but also dragging folks into the crypto world, uh, like like you just said, where you came in on this one too. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. And I mean, this, this story is, is definitely exactly why every single time we have talked about this and every single time we will talk about it in the future, it's our, it's our hard hat section. It's our, you know, this is high, high, high risk. This is, you know, mitigate appropriately, um, all that good stuff because this, this one was yet another exploit in the crypto world. Um, but it was especially, I think, disappointing, um, painful emotionally to me financially. You know, like I said, it was I missed, I mitigated, you know, everything. It, it still would have hurt because it was my biggest play, um, because of the fundamental nature of it. That it, you know, it was uh, something that I was comfortable with the plan, and the plan was solid uh, as from a fundamental nature of it. Um, but it just, yeah, it, it stung because it, uh, <clears throat> it was, it was a good plan spoiled by a black swan, I guess we could say. So how, how, how's this, how's the saying go? Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and that's probably triply true, uh, in the crypto world that, uh, you just, uh, there's so much, I mean, there's, there's so many takeaways. I mean, obviously we'll, we'll get into all of them, but I, I guess one of the things up top is, is this is, this is an example of where, um, consumer protections are so important. Uh, and yet, you know, it's, it's a world of, uh, it's a world where all of that stuff is, is heavily frowned upon because that's the government coming in or, you know, all this, uh, they just want to, da, 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 da. you know, you've, you've all heard the story and whatnot. Um, but we'll go through the story. Uh, and I want to circle back on that consumer protections because it is interesting. I mean, this is, this is also at the same time of why this is so speculative, risky, all that kind of stuff. It's also exactly why I'm still here because it's just interesting to see these things evolve 
to see reactions evolve. And so on that consumer protections front, there are ways that uh, uniquely um, unique to the space, to, to the crypto blockchain space, that protections can be put in place and are being put in place in the light of this. So uh, let's start with what happened. So there was, um, <clears throat> there's two protocols uh, three, but the middleman we will we'll cut out. It, that one didn't matter. Um, <clears throat> there's there's two protocols here that we'll talk about. Um, like I said, we'll we'll use names, but uh, you know this isn't advocating anything about anybody. Um, but just to assign them names, there's one which is called Delta Prime, which we have talked about on the show. I think the names come up, and we definitely walk through their product offering several times. And I do love their product offering and what they're building. The second name <clears throat> is Platypus. And this is one that, um, you know, if, 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 if we take any way, anything away from any of the names, um, Platypus is the name that, you know, let, let's just always stay away from Platypus. That's my role now. That's my rule now going forward. <laughs> it is, this was their third exploit. Um, you know, fool me once, fool me twice, all that good stuff. Um, <clears throat> And the first time they got exploited, it was it was bad. It was to the tune of, uh, I want to say, shoot, I don't even remember exactly, but forty or fifty, maybe almost seventy million dollars. Um, and it was their own token that got exploited, so it just caused a whole big thing. And it took them uh, seven months to fully settle that situation. Uh, people still took losses, but they did get some of the money back, and they did do some reimbursements and things like that. And ironically, <laughs> one week before this exploit, they had just tweeted out about the final round of reimbursements from the exploit. So if you went to their Twitter on the latest exploit, you were like, hey, reimburse. Oh, that's the last one. <laughs> that's, uh, so what had happened was uh, we were we were in a investment strategy. <clears throat> um, and I think... I don't know. I mean, I think I would call it investment more so than trading um, because we were we were utilizing a mechanic of value accrual of a particular token. And so I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but I'm going to equate it to, uh, let's say, bonds. Yeah, we, we Sprockets talked about bonds before. And just at a very high level, you pay $98, let's say. And in one month, you can sell that one bond token for a hundred dollars. And so you gain $2, uh, 2% yield over the month. Um, <clears throat> so instead of explaining the crypto version, let's just stick with that. This bond token, you buy one bond token and you get 2% over the course of the month. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the role, so that was essentially the, the asset we were dealing with it was an asset just like that, where you buy it. And then later it, it has a mechanic in it that accrues value um, based on a fundamental service to the blockchain, all that kind of stuff, uh, which is which I'm, which is worth at least somewhat mentioning because you know we talk all the time. You do need to know where the yield comes from and all that. So it is something that passed both of our sniffer tests as far as like okay, the value is coming from a legitimate source, um, you know, all that kind of thing. So you buy this one bond token, uh, you hold it, <clears throat> and then later. Uh, you know, you can sell it back for that, for that yield. Um, the role in this whole thing is Delta Prime's. Delta Prime's role is they are the mediators to let you leverage borrow. So take an under collateralized loan, uh, which we talked about before, where you say, I'm putting up a hundred dollars of collateral and they say, cool, we'll let you borrow up to $400. Um, <clears throat> and you'll pay an interest rate on that loan. And so obviously you can imagine in this same exact scenario we're talking about, uh, why would I wanna do that? Well, because now with uh, $100 and then borrow $400, now I have $500 total that I can uh, take and go buy five bond tokens and now earn $10. So 10% of my $100 of collateral and uh, now uh, sure I'll pay now I'm earning 10% per month. So I'll pay you 3% interest 
and I'm going to net this, you know, 7% difference. And so it's just a, a capital efficiency um, and, and getting those loans in place, connecting borrowers to lenders. That was the role of Delta Prime in all of this. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing Delta Prime does is they work with um, other partner protocols. In this case, Platypus was one of them. And so the way that they keep you, because this is all trustless, so, you know, you might be thinking, well, how are you not just going to borrow $400 and, and hightail it out of here? Well, they create a walled garden for you and they say, hey, you can borrow this extra money, pay this interest rate, but you can't just take this money wherever you want. You, you, know, you have to, you can only interact with these approved whitelisted contracts. Those contracts happen to be from partner projects like Platypus. And the role of Platypus was to auto compound um, the that yield, um, and so you just let it sit there; it would auto compound the the value and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> actually, I said I said that wrong. the The role of Platypus was just to, to we were rep providing liquidity to trade this bond token, we'll call it, um, on the Platypus platform, and so we leveraged it. Then we sent it over there so people could trade it. Um, and we just, you know, got our yield out of the token. Um, so that's the gist of the setup. And so then what happened was the Platypus platform, the Platypus protocol, that pool, which we, we happened to be swimming in uh, through Delta Prime, that pool got hacked and somebody exploited their contract and drained, I think it was to the tune of, uh, $12 million, seven to $12 million, somewhere in there. Um, uh, and that's a problem because we were sitting in that pool with money. We didn't own, we were sitting in that pool with money we borrowed. Um, and so then that creates a problem over on the Delta prime side, because when those tokens disappear, now it looks like your account is insolvent and potentially going to be liquidated because they need to reclaim your collateral to cover the gap of the funds that were missing. Um, so fast forward, long story short, none of that ended up happening to us, the liquidation thing. Um, it actually took about a month for all of this to play out. So what, it, what did happen was the pool was hacked immediately the Platypus protocol locked the pool so nobody could trade in the pool or do anything with it um, while they sorted everything out. They, just like they did on their first hack, they reverse hacked the hacker <laughs> and they actually uh, clawed back um, something like 10% of the funds, or no, I think it was like 5% of the funds. They clawed it back right away. Um, and then after that, they made contact with the hacker, uh, the exploiter, um, and they made contact with them and they worked out a deal where the exploiter pulled what is becoming a little bit of a suspicious trend where they were like, oh, I'm a white hat. I'm a white hat. Uh, just, you know, just give me a finder's fee and I'll return the money to you. And so I say suspicious because that's not how white hat operations work. Uh, white hats kind of make themselves known a little bit better other than you got caught <laughs> and then you go, Oh no, 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 I'm a white hat. Um, but nonetheless, they did get, um, something like 90% of the funds back from the exploiter. Um, and then the part of the deal, they promised not to pursue charges, all that kind of sort of thing. Um, so, and then that left them with a much smaller gap of missing funds which they were able to backfill with some treasury um, and all said and done, the pool came up 0.89% short, um, which then made things for Sprocket and I much easier. Life was much better because that gap largely got filled eventually. Um, but it got filled in a way that's not very comfortable. It got filled in, uh, just happened. They just happened to be able to claw back a big chunk of it. They just happened to be able to engage in uh, dialogue to retrieve the funds back and work out a, a settlement. And then they also got the funds back by being able to backfill out of the treasury. So the point making there is that none of this came from any sort of insurance or protected entity or, you know, all that sort of stuff. It just was kind of happenstance that it just happened to be able to come back. 
Um, so that's the gist of it. Um, I guess I'll pause there because I don't know if Sprocket, the, the situation unrolled any differently uh, through your eyes or if you had any, any other insights to the setup so far. Yeah, no, it you, you pretty much laid it out there. I mean, a couple of things that I'd call out there is, you know, you equate it to all of a sudden somebody drained the pool of this money. And it's just like if you got uh, borrowed money from anybody and while you had it, somebody stole it from you. And then this good person's like, yeah, I don't really care if you had your money stolen. I, I need it back. Um, and so that's, that's effectively where we were at. And I had lots of, uh, I don't know, PTSD is the right word, but but flashbacks uh, to to my original entry into the crypto space where, you know, I had appreciated a bunch of this Bitcoin and I'm going to sell it and I put it in an exchange and poof, one day it was gone. Mount Gox, <laughs> the Bitcoin all got lost. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Nobody knows. Went into another wallet. Um, and, and to me, this is just, you know, we, we talk about this in the show, like, oh, you have to have the custodial wallet like don't give up the custodial effort of your crypto and everything so i knew full well going into this that that's what we were doing like the only way that this works right is you put up collateral and then as part of that there you're provided this this leverage on that collateral but guess what that collateral is not in a wallet that i control I'm, I'm turning it over into a contract i'm turning it over into a pool and so you know right there you are surrendering surrendering it just like you, when i put money in a bank i'm trusting that that bank is is not going to go uh to the local casino and gamble away all my money that i've given them now there are protections and stuff that we'll we'll loop back to in in that that analogy there but but effectively that's that's largely what happened yeah we were in a in a system and part of that system had a chink in the armor and that left a lot of funds to disappear one day. And so it was quite lucky that things got back. And I'll admit, um, w w when we played out things, whenever I put crypto in someone else's wallet, I'm like, huh, I might never see that again. That goes in my brain. <laughs> but to be honest, the, the the probability of that is so low in some of these cases that you're like, yeah, yeah, I guess that could happen, but it's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, and that's really kind of where I was in this. We're like, okay, yeah, I get it. We're putting it in somebody else's wallet, but we're balancing these these uh, assets. You know, it's it's the the bank is is lending us money at this rate, but I know I get this guaranteed return at this rent rate. It was kind of a mm, how can this go wrong? But yeah, yep. there we are. There, here we are. So, and I mean, and kind of adding on to that, you know, like it, we didn't really go completely blindly into this. I mean, I think Sprocket was, you know, kind of took a decent amount of my word uh, because I'm obviously a little more plugged in to the projects and things like that. But the, on the Delta prime side of the equation, um, you know, that team has consistently blown away my expectations on their focus on sustainability, their focus on security and all that sort of stuff. But as I described in the situation, they can only go so far with that because the, at the end of the day, they're opening a window that they're, you know, they're, they're curating that window. But at the end of the day, you still have to leave their house and go to a partner protocol. Um, so they can only protect their house. Um, and they can do as much effort as possible to vet and make sure that they whitelist uh, legitimate teams and all that sort of thing, which, you know, as much as I'm never touching platypus again, the team is still legitimate at platypus borderline incompetent at this point after getting exploited three different times. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of things we can go into on that some other time, as far as the, the secureness of, of, uh, of, of smart contracts and all that sort of thing. So I think that made it, sting a little bit more because it was a realization on my part of like this thing, you know, I was so focused on vetting the Delta prime part of the equation. Cause, because, uh, historically speaking, Delta prime was way more new than platypus was in this equation. So I was very focused on the Delta prime side of it. Um, <clears throat> and at the end of the day, honestly, there was no, due diligence that I could have done on platypus that uh, would have changed the situation. Like, I mean, exploits are just the deep levels of the code. 
I mean, maybe if I just went line by line by the code and I, maybe I could have found the exploit myself. Uh, but, uh, you know, it wasn't like a, a due diligence thing of like the team was just total scum or something like that. Um, so that kind of made it eye opening and also sting a little bit more when I realized uh, in this particular setup, no matter how good the product is on the Delta Prime side, the product at this stage is only as good as the partners that they partner with and allow you to invest the money in. Um, which brings me to light at the end of the tunnel, though this has been put on a big pause as far as like, I think both of us have completely evacuated. Now we got our money back. Um, I basically lost, I lost, uh, the gains that I had made the yield that I had earned over the past seven months. I lost, I don't know, somewhere around 90% of that, but I didn't actually lose any of the capital that I put in. I don't believe Sprocket was quite that lucky because he was not in as long as me. Is that true? That some of your uh, some of your hit was actually on initial capital. Yep, yep. So I was gonna kind of qualify some of my losses on this. Um, I also think you were doing some other interesting things where you were trying to buy down down your debt and swing swing trade some of that stuff that I think helped you uh, get more gains yeah. than me where my gains were, were pure organic through the yield. I think you were doing a little alpha there. Um, so to just to frame it, right, the only reason I got into this, right, is I want to accrue AVAX. Like that is my goal. Um, we've talked about this before. I am all about the plumbing of a system, right? I want to be the Visa. I want to be the, 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 the MasterCard. I want to collect those transaction fees. I don't care about the token going up, going down. I want the transaction or transaction fees. In order to do that, you have to be able to stake. And in order to stake, you have to do a proof of uh, uh, stake, uh, basically pony up a bunch of AVAX tokens to run a validator. And so my goal has been to how can I get more and more of these AVAX tokens? I don't care if AVAX goes to $100, $5, $10. I don't care. I just need more AVAX. And so running or delegating to a validator when you don't have enough to run your own validator node um, yields around, you know, 7%, uh, 7 to 8% return on AVAX monthly. Uh, well, sorry, annually, but you, you get it paid out monthly uh, because I stake a month at a time. And so this strategy that we put forth was effectively virtual uh, staking, same as I was doing. The only difference was I could leverage that. So let's say in a month, I typically, with the amount of AVAX that I was staking, I would get about one AVAX a month. And th this way, I could basically quadruple the amount of AVAX through that leverage borrowing and go from one AVAX a month to four AVAX a month comes in. Um, and that's that's the that was the appeal to me. It seemed just as safe as staking, uh, albeit it's leaving my wallet. That's the difference. And I... We, uh, Viper and I talked about this. I said, when I'm staking, that money is guaranteed to never leave my wallet. It's just like locked up um, and, and, and prevent it. Like you'll always get the, your base back. You might not get your yield, but you get your, you'll get your capital back. This, I was giving up that. So I was risking that stuff to get this 4X return. Um, so when it's all said and done, like you hear this, oh, it was only 0.89% love of the pool. Um, and what did that mean for me? Fundamentally, it basically means from the amount of AVAX that I put into this to the amount of AVAX when I completely liquidated, I was nine AVAX short. So I lost nine AVAX. Okay. Wow. 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 <laughs> only nine AVAX. What are you crying about? You, you could have lost a whole lot more. That's true. But now I got to go back to my old way of, of delegation, right? Where I'm picking up about one, it's a little bit more. It's like now 1.2, something like that, AVAX per month. That's what I get. And so this effort, which I was in there for maybe three months or something, maybe, maybe more. I don't remember the total time, but I was in there for that length of time. And now I am negative nine AVAX. So in order for me to get that nine AVAX back, I'm looking at seven to eight months just to get back to where I was when I started the Delta Prime experiment. Yeah. Um, so this is a significant blow to my strategy. And you might think, why, why, why? It's not that bad. But, but if you think about what is the magnitude in the objective that I had. And I guess to, to summarize that, 
if we use the bond example and you know the bond token is ninety eight dollars um essentially what you're doing is you know with one token you get two dollars at the end of the month and so uh starting the next month you would take that two dollars and pick up 0 0.02 token bond tokens and add it to your one bond token you just had the previous month so going into the second month you had a 1.02 uh, tokens going into the second month so like you just said you don't care about the price you just want more of those bond tokens uh, over time. And so you can imagine the leverage uh, now earning 0.1 with the leverage that I discussed earlier and that letting you stack it faster and quicker. Um, <clears throat> and then the other point I was gonna make was, uh, yeah, so when, when you hear only 0.89% only of the pool was lost, that's true, that sounds small, but then you factor in the leverage, and this is true anytime you're using leverage anywhere. I mean, this is true on futures options. This is true, you know, anywhere leverage is involved, a percent move is multiplied by whatever leverage is applied to it. So in the 0.89, let's say we weren't because you can't, but uh, let's say you're 10x leverage, a 0.89% loss of the pool means you were exposed to 8.9% loss because you were using 10x funds in that pool. And so that's kind of a thing with leverage as far as, you know, quantifying these percentages and things like that, that it, the leverage has to factor in at that point. So it actually comes out much higher than what that sounds like. How do, how do, how do you fix this? And that was the question uh, I was left with. <laughs> and it was very disheartening because uh, you know, like I said, on the Delta Prime side, they had this focus on as much consumer protection as they could. And uh, so ever since the last platypus exploit, um, they actually instituted a fee anytime anybody was liquidated, a, a stability pool fee would get pulled out of that liquidation. Whoever was liquidated had to pay an extra fee that went to this stability pool. Um, and that stability pool was essentially insurance because in this equation there's a lender and a borrower and so it was you know it was partly mine and then part and then mostly the lender's money that got lost so um in this stability pool um the purpose of that was to first and foremost refund the lenders and make them whole right away and the the reason that that was focused was because when you show up as a lender you deposit the money and you have no control over where the borrower takes it. So it's very much out of your hands. And so therefore they used those fees collected to immediately make whole the lenders, um, which was, which was good. I mean, that was a lesson learned from the first time, the first time around there was no protection for lender or borrower. Um, <clears throat> so now this time around I was like, okay, well that's cool that the lenders were protected, but the borrowers, like we were just left full face frontal to this black swan event and that kind of sucks. And that's, and so I, you know, was, was talking to the team. I was like, well, that, what's your plan? Because that's not sustainable to just leave borrowers, you know, fully exposed to these events. Um, and they said that they, for months now, they've been working with um, some different security platforms and protocols to help mitigate this kind of situation. It sucks that it wasn't in place before this happened, but they announced what all those plans are. And now this is where I, things get interesting. And like I said, I like being in this space to see these things develop. And, you know, it's just interesting to me. So the very first thing, there's three, so there's essentially three prongs of security that are going into place to try to protect this exact situation. The first prong is a particular security firm um, that monitors smart contract activity. And when they detect that something is about to go down, related to an exploit. And obviously some of these details are obfuscated for security purposes. Um, but through the use of AI technology and all of this different, these different algorithms, when they detect and they monitor all, you know, as all the smart contracts deployed, 
and they can focus in on like the platypus contracts. They can focus in on what somebody has a particular interest in um, and they can watch blockchain activity. And when they see activity that is reminiscent of an exploit about to happen or an exploit being prepared or whatever their secret recipe is, um, they will initiate an auto withdrawal from the pool that has been flagged as suspicious of something bad is about to happen. Um, and they demonstrated this to the team. Uh, they, they, they showed the history of running this, running this thing. Um, and it's never had a false flag and it absolutely flat would have flagged this situation before the pool was locked. And therefore we would have been automatically withdrawn and then the exploit would have carried out and we would have had zero exposure to it. Um, so that's neat from a security standpoint. Uh, you know, I mean, their, their, their entire business is it. So I, I trust that there's a lot of really important details that are being obfuscated out. Obviously my first thought goes to, I don't know, man, (laughs) that sounds like if you're, that sounds like you're creating a tool for future exploiters to leverage, to cause more chaos. Like, you know, I mean, just, and this is way oversimplified, but I mean, just imagine, you know, you could create a contract and make it think something was going to happen, which then made it do this massive withdrawal, which opens up this other window that you could jump through. I mean, that's the game of security, right? Like it's always this ever changing battlefield of trying to outpace each other. Um, I don't say that to say that's the case. Like I said, I trust that, you know, I mean, it's like your, 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 all your other security firms in the world of tech that, I I trust that they got it under control and it's not nearly as oversimplified as I made it sound. But nonetheless, I was like, I hope that's not the only thing we're relying on because that's cool, but it doesn't feel complete. Um, So the other two prongs, the second prong is a very, very, very well-known protocol, um, which has actively protected billions of dollars for all the major exchanges and all that sort of stuff. And what they do is they will use on-chain analysis to chase stolen funds. Uh, and they will, um, they will follow those funds and they will cut it off at the off-ramps because all money eventually makes its way to an off-ramp. And when it gets there, they will initiate certain levers that they have control over to shut down the off ramp essentially and and stop the funds there and pull them back and return them so again cool but not a complete solution but i i like the combo there so these two prongs are great and i mean they 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 truly like they they're way better than nothing and i you know i really like the sound of the first one so it's you know using that technology using ai to interpret chain activity all that good stuff the second one of, you know, being the cops and chasing the robbers and, you know, with with uh, resources, you know, the, the, this protocol has those resources to do that chasing and has the pull to be able to shut down the on ramps or the off ramps. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still a little bit up in the air of like, what if it doesn't trigger or what if they can't chase down and recover all the money? Um, so the third prong is actually one that I really, really like because it it really encapsulates the power of this decentralized blockchain world. And that is um, there's, and there's other real world uses that we've seen this laid out, played out in. And I, I don't think we've talked about them on the show, but it is one of the most interesting use cases in my opinion, and that's insurance. Um, you know, t- today you traditionally would pay an insurance company uh, hurricane house insurance, all that kind of stuff. You're paying your premium to your insurance provider and you know, they're taking that money. They're going and putting it in their coffers, doing whatever they want to do with it. Um, and they're promising to cover X, Y, Z. Um, and so the insurance world is an area that I think has so much awesome real world potential in a decentralized blockchain world. I'm going to try not to get distracted on all of the different use cases and just focus on this one. So in this one particular scenario, say Delta Prime flips the switch and offers this as an option to borrowers to say, hey, will you pay an extra half a percent to go to this premium, which is going to guarantee 
that they will cover X amount of money in the event of a of an exploit of a loss. Um, you know, just like any insurance com- in, insurance provider would. Um, and again, you're on leverage. You're potentially doing all these different strategies where you're earning way more than that half percent and all that sort of thing. So you're like, yeah, I want that protection. I want that insurance. Um, so I'm going to flip that on. And so real quick, the way that works on the insurance side is this is a pool of community funds that's all contributed, again, trustlessly. And people would put their money in there to earn some of those fees um, so again, it's a lender borrower situation where like the lenders are supplying a chunk of that pool. The premiums that are getting paid from the protocols are actually helping to not just fill the pool, but also pay that interest rate to the lenders of the insurance pool. Um, and so it's all, and the benefit of it all being on chain, there is no black box, you know, like putting it in the company coffers, like everybody can see what the insurance pool is, how much it is, all that kind of stuff, and verify that it would have the the, the, the means necessary to cover an exploit of X amount. Um, <clears throat> so to me, that's the most interesting prong, that third one. But I do like how the three work together. Again, you have sniff it out, cut it off before it happens. You have the police chasing them down. And in the event that both of those fail, you have just an actual honest to goodness insurance policy to help fill the gap of whatever was stolen. So um, not all, the, the third one is actually rolling out now. That's the first one they're doing. Um, and then the other two will be coming online later. So we'll see how that, how that plays out. Um, I like it, uh, but I'm not in yet. <laughs> I'm going to wait and see how this plays out. But I'm also going to monitor and find probably a different strategy, um, especially going into the market we're going into. The, what we were doing was really, really good for a very slow, sideways, down market, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's a different topic for a different day. But I'm going to just pull back a second and reevaluate all the things, especially how these uh, security things uh, instruments get implemented. Yeah, I actually those those three different protections you mentioned, uh, they make me I draw a couple of parallels there. I'll, I'll work uh, for the most recent one backwards. Um, the whole insurance fund, like that is not that that is a topic that's very prevalent in various industries today. A couple examples that come to mind um, in recent news, right? The the UAW just went on strike, uh, and and when the UAW goes on strike, that's when their workers basically say, you know what, enough of this. We're walking out. We're not doing work for you, uh, you know, General Motors, Ford, until you help negotiate our stuff. Well, those guys don't get paid when they're on that. And uh, states have certain unemployment and stuff like that. But the union collects what they call strike funds. And so through the dues that their members pay, so to be a member of the union, to have the union represent you, to have the union stand for you, you pay annual dues to the to the to the union. A portion of those dues go into a strike uh, per, a wage protection fund, and what that allows the union to do is that while they're on strike, to help their members who uh, have gaps covered where you know uh, unemployment will cover some of it. Uh, certain states have certain labor protection laws; those will com- cover some of their wages. But there could be a gap, and that's where the unions can use these strike funds to help pay the the union workers uh, a fee or not fees, but pay them wages while they're on strike because they're striking for the betterment of the union. Um, there is a couple of bar associations uh, throughout the the. United States, where the state bar uh, collects money from the lawyers that are, are licensed to practice law. And those lawyers all pledge a, a, a code of ethics. And in order to hold up that code of ethics, they say, look, there's going to be a couple of bad apples that go in there. So we're going to give this much money as part of our license into a fund that will protect clients who have been abused by by someone who has gone off the rails and not not pledged. Not only will we disbar that person uh, from the bar, but uh, once all other means are exhausted for funds that they lost, there is this, this client protection fund that will help reimburse that client that might have paid fees to a lawyer uh, that was unscrupulous or, or something to that effect. And so it's not anything new to this space. It's been used uh, elsewhere. And so that's, that's kind of the analogy there. 
the other one that you were talking about uh, just before that one uh, made me really think of, you said, well, they like to follow the money to the off ramps and, you know, we'll get them at the off ramps. And, and I kind of think to, to movies and things like that, where, you know, you got these hijackers on a plane and they're like, yeah, we're, we're hijacking this plane. And the uh, other people are like, yeah, at some point you're going to land. <laughs> um, and you're going to be in this, uh, little tube, so I guess we'll see you when you <laughs> land. And they're always like, we need in-air refueling. Uh, but but anyway, yeah, that, that's what made me think there. Of like, yeah, okay, we'll chase them down. The one that really kind of made me uh, laugh a little bit inside is when they, you, you talked about this, this mechanism that will be protected to lock down the pool, get your money out. And you're like, yeah, this seems like something that could be exploited by an attacker. Uh hundred percent. And the first thing, it's probably because Christmas season is coming up, but the first thing that jumps to my mind is the best Christmas movie of all time is Die Hard. And in Die Hard, they're, they're trying to get into the safe of the Nakatomi Tower. And part of the Nakatomi Tower has this most elaborate security mechanism of this thing. And then you have to get past this gate and this gate and this gate. And then the end lock is this electromagnetic lock, which the only thing that could, could break it is this EMP pulse or something like that, that would just super disrupt the power and everything. Well, part of the attacker's plan was to basically get the, the city of Los Angeles to cut the building's power, uh, and they, they, they tricked them into cutting the building's power. Well, what happened when they cut the building's power? Whoop, the electromagnetic <laughs> lock failed to function. Uh, and then they could get through the last lock, which was supposed to be impossible. And so that's, that's what that protection made me think of. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But sounds like a lot of more moving parts that are just another thing to be exploited. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and honestly, like the insurance one is the one I wanted to hear above all else, because that's the thing that, uh, that you just expect. Like no one puts their money in their bank and then waits to say, oops, Hey, guess what? This month bank X, Y, Z got hacked and the money's gone. Sorry guys. Like they like, we've been through this. We've on the show. We've been through this with banks collapsing that there is FDIC, uh, insurance on up to X amount of money and you know what that limit is. So you can plan accordingly with your funds or whatever. Um, and it's just there and it's a protection and it's there for a reason. And right now it's completely void in the, the crypto space. So to see it being implemented in still a decentralized way, um, was very interesting to me. Um, I still personally, like, even though, yeah, okay, it's cool. It's, you know, uses decentralization and whatnot. Like for some of these big plays or some of these fundamental financial plays and things like that, I, I don't, I want more. I want the official, I want the FDIC stamp. I want, you know, that's part of, you know, where, where, where we'll, where we might actually start actually advocating platforms on this show is when there's actually regulated, uh, protections in place because this stuff happens because the the space is immature as far as smart contract security, all that sort of stuff. So this is why we always put our hard hats on. This is why I don't expose a giant, you know, painful amount of money to this space because it's just not safe on this level. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Like I said, it's been a while since we dabbled in the crypto space. This was a very real and tangible example of some of the great links that the crypto space has to go yet uh, to have a lot more parity with the modern or, or today's traditional financial markets. Not to say that it won't get there. Not to say that this stuff's not exploring, not worth exploring. Uh, but but really, your mileage, you know, be be cautious, be ever vigilant in there. Uh, always expect the worst case thing to happen. Uh, plan for the worst case thing, and then you'll never be disappointed. Uh, well, am I going to shy away from the crypto space now? No, probably not. But am I going to be more cautious the next time I go in something? Am I going to look at things from a different perspective? Absolutely. Um, 
you know, and, and this is where you discover your own risk tolerance. What 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 makes you comfortable? What doesn't make you comfortable? These are the the thought exercises you should go through uh, before embarking on on departing away with a large chunk of capital uh, into something like this, or even in even in equities or or anywhere else in traditional finance. Right? You, you need to think about the worst case scenario, the likelihood of that, and that will help guide you in your personal risk tolerance, uh, which will really help guide you know where you do that. So hopefully this was an interesting episode to you and you got some enjoyment out of it. Otherwise, there's a lot more trading coming up as we dial down the year. Uh, will the Santa Claus rally appear? I don't know. Is it starting now? Maybe. I'm not <laughs> sure. But lots of action happen out there and we'll keep our eye on it and hope you have good luck trading out there. And remember, think outside the block. <laughs>